Welcome to the Lend Academy podcast, episode number 36. This is your host, Peter Renton, founder of Lend Academy. So today on the show, we are coming to you from Sydney, Australia, which is actually my hometown, and I'm down here on vacation with my family. I took a bit of a uh, bit of time off after Lend It, but I also took some time out from my vacation to chat with some of the platforms here in Sydney. There's quite a lot of a uh, lot of things happening here, and I dropped by the Society One offices this afternoon and had a chat with Matt Simons, who is one of the co-founders of Society One. Now, they are the largest and the first platform in Australia, and I've known Matt uh, for quite some time since soon after they launched, and always wanted to get him on the show because I think Society One do uh, do some very interesting things. So got them on the show, talked about the peer-to-peer lending environment here, the banking system here, the regulatory environment, and also, of course, about Society One, what they've been up to and you know, what uh, some of the things they've been working on. Hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the podcast, Matt. Thanks, Peter. Good to be here. Okay, so why don't we start with giving the listeners a bit of background about your history and how you came to, you know, to start Society One. Well, I'm, uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Society One. Greg, my partner, is the guy who really had uh, spent the time in the, uh, in the personal lending and uh, an unsecured uh, consumer space. Greg had uh, built a lot of technology in the early years, and uh, Greg and his team were really the, uh, the guys who decided that there was a fantastic opportunity to turn their loan origination platform into one of the first P2P lenders in this part of the world. So I joined Greg after I'd been living in the US and had seen the success of Lending Club, and I thought that... Gee, there had to be an opportunity to create a, a P2P slash marketplace lender in this part of the world down under. And I was fortunate to meet Greg, and uh, we were equally fortunate that we happened to have the world's most profitable banking system down here. <laughs> so uh, we figured that it'd be pretty embarrassing if we couldn't make some kind of P2P lending proposition work in this part of the world. So yeah. we, we got started, and that's that's the background to uh, Society One. Okay, so then how does it work here? Can you just explain a little bit about your model? I mean, are you similar to Lending Club? I mean, how, how are you similar? How are you different? I think we're broadly similar in the sense that uh, we're using a technology platform to connect creditworthy borrowers on one side with investors on the other. Uh, in Australia, that means that you need an AFSL, which is a financial service license for your investor-facing regulation, and you need an ACL, which is an Australian credit license for your borrower-facing uh, regulation. And that's all managed by ASIC, which is the, the regulator here in Australia. So uh, we put that infrastructure in place, and then I guess uh, we, we, we started trading. We made the policy decision, Peter, to begin focused on what are called uh, institutional or sophisticated investors in Australia. Uh, we felt it was important to prove the model worked before we opened it up to, to retail investors, and uh, we always plan to do that after you know a, a few years uh, of track record. Uh, so we've done that, and I guess uh, I guess you know now we're we're in the process of really ramping up the book. In terms of the way the model works here, the nuance is that there's much less credit data than is available in the U.S. So right. People can't just type their FICO score into a box and get a price. So uh, we've had to make a number of tweaks to the way that model works. That affects uh, what the front end experience looks like. It affects. Uh, how the underlying credit models work, etc. But uh, I think, in broad terms, we would say we're operating a lending club type, type marketplace here that gives investors the opportunity to get direct exposure to this fabulous asset class. Right. So, so the, the difference being, I guess, today that you are focused on what we, what we call in the US accredited investors only. That you said you're in the process of changing that. Yes. Yeah. We're very close to having everything we need in place to feel like it's an appropriate time to launch uh, our retail product offering, and we'll be doing that in short order. And then and that, that'll be available to any investor in the country? Open to everyone. Okay. Okay, that's cool. So I want to I give the listeners a bit of a background about the banking industry here, because uh, you know, in, in Australia, it's very different from the US, where in Australia, we have you know, there's four big banks that basically control the majority of banking. So can you give give the listeners a bit of a flavor of you know, what, you know, what the lending environment is like and how the big banks operate? Yeah. Well, the first most important difference, Peter, as I alluded to earlier, is that we've had historically in Australia what's called a negative credit reporting environment, which means we don't capture a lot of the rich data that's available in in markets like the US or the UK where 
P2P lending has uh, been, been so successful. Uh, that's now slowly changing in Australia, and uh, as of this year, there's uh, now the first wave of comprehensive credit reporting, which has happened. That happened in March 2015, mm-hmm. and so Australia is now moving to a comprehensive credit reporting, which means that it brings it more into line with the OECD practice, and particularly from a P2P global community point of view, much more uh, like the uh, environment in the US and, and places like the UK. So that's that's at the highest level. So what that means in practice is that banks and other uh, consumer credit providers have not had to contribute data into a central bureau other than in situations where the consumer has had a problem in repaying one of their loans. So what you have is what's called negative reporting, which means you can't unearth any of the real richness that comes with understanding the current sort of as-is position of the borrower uh, as you would expect in in markets like the US. And so the banks don't really need to do that. They don't need to use the external credit data because they have so many customers themselves. They have their own loan book, which has all the data they need. Is that so that there's been no incentive for them to kind of share? Well, certainly, if you look at the objective evidence, you would say that negative reporting, Peter, has not hurt Australian bank profits. Right. As I, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're blessed with the world's most profitable banking system, and so um, that, that, that hasn't been adverse to shareholder returns for large Australian banks. I heard somewhere it was like 2.5% of the GDP is like the net profit of the banks here, it's which is a, astounding to me. It's interesting that a country the size of Australia has banks that rank in the top bracket globally of banks by market cap and profitability. It's, right. Um, it's a positive in the sense it gives you a very robust, profitable banking system, which is a good thing. Right. Uh, the downside is it means that uh, hardworking Australians aren't necessarily getting uh, the sort of risk-based price that's available uh, internationally, including with the success right. of sort of marketplace lenders. Sure. So, and we should also say that you know Australia, a lot of listeners wouldn't realise this, but you know managed to escape the, the global financial crisis uh, relatively unscathed. Would you say? Well, I would say that, and I'd say that, that it's a credit to the to the Australian regulators and, and frankly, to the banks themselves that they, uh, they've they managed to bypass uh, a lot of the challenges that occurred, uh, as you and I know well, because I was living in the US at the time, through the subprime crisis. Right, right. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the regulatory environment that that you operate in and what is required to – you mentioned it briefly, the two licenses on each mm-hmm. side. Yeah. But how – like – what is required from you to have, particularly on the investor side, to take sophisticated investors and what, what additional light, um, regulatory burden is in place for, to do retail? Uh, well, I think my general observation, Peter, would be that the regulator here in Australia, ASIC, has had a very uh, proactive view. It's been very encouraging of people looking to build marketplace lending businesses and uh, we Certainly speaking from our own experience, I've had a a great dialogue with the regulator here. The process itself is essentially that you have to satisfy a set of legislative and policy standards that basically mean that you're going to uh, represent on the consumer or the borrower side. Uh, You're you're going to adhere to a a set of codified standards about the process by which you'll assess the borrower's capacity to repay, the circumstances under which you'll um, assess and structure the loan in light of their capacity to repay, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a lot of standards that one has to build into your initially accredited application and then into your internal and ongoing processes. And so that's that's what has to happen on the borrower side. On the investor side that you mentioned, you really have to create a legal structure where you can appropriately house and segregate the, um, the assets that you're creating. And then you can fractionalize the exposure in a way you'd be familiar with with lending club notes. There's a few nuances and tweaks about how you need to do that in the local environment here in Australia, but broadly it's the same, uh, it's the same outcome. Okay, so then what additional pieces are in place to do retail? And you said you... So, so from there, really, um, you need to register a PDS, a product disclosure document, and you need to have uh, a registered managed investment scheme. But uh, those two things aren't the principal barrier, really. It's, it's actually, I think, the P2P lender deciding that from a policy point of view, they feel they're confident enough to, to go and enable individual investors, uh, retail investors, to, to come and invest directly in the platform. Right, right. Okay, okay. So then I'm just curious, you've got, you've got all this negative credit reporting environment. How do you underwrite your loans when, for example, I, I presume you don't have like what the extant, outstanding you know, balances on the credit Correct. cards and stuff like that? So how do you underwrite? Yeah. So what you have to do in that environment is you have to create a model where there's sufficient incentive for the borrower to provide you with the additional data you need to discriminate the underwrite decision. So, again, self-reported then? Is that well, what you're saying? We, we, 
uh, have a business model that says to the borrower, we'll reward you with the lowest rate in the market if you provide us with the additional data, which we can then verify through okay. independent third-party sources. Right. And so the core of the model is really a give-get approach. It basically says, look, we think this market is one where because you have four large banks, as you mentioned, that have tended to dominate the category and because there hasn't been any risk-based pricing, the very best credit, i.e. lowest default risk customers, tend to be paying a price that is in effect subsidizing the entire pool. Right. So our message to the market is, look, if you're one of those people or you believe you are, we'll give you an opportunity to provide the information that validates through third-party sources, your transactional bank statements, your uh, credit file, uh, other, other information that we'll collect as part of the application process, uh, that you are in fact in that low default cohort. And if that's the case, we'll reward you with the best price in the market. So that's essentially how we do it. We construct an application process that has the opportunity for an investor to provide that information. And we make it relatively easy for people to do that, you know, upload via Yodely your bank statements and other things that would give us the uh, verification data we need around things like income and expense uh, ratios at the household or the individual. Level. Right. Okay. Okay. So then what is the typical borrower then? I mean, who, who is coming? Are these people that could get a bank loan but choose not to? I mean, who is coming to Society One? Yeah, our typical borrower is someone who is aware uh, of the fact that there may be better options out there than a traditional bank who would probably qualify for a traditional bank loan and who uh, perhaps has been looking around on rate comparison sites or doing some online research and realizes that there's a possibility to make a saving. They would then come to societyone.com.au and apply for a loan. Uh, we would then uh, assess that application and if, if, if uh, they fell within uh, one of our credit criteria that we'll write loans for, then their loan gets listed in the marketplace and uh, investors uh, allocated to that loan. Uh, okay, so, what, so what, are, what are the sort of things they use they're applying for a loan? Well, you know, Peter, my, my favourite loan is still uh, a gentleman uh, who happened to live on the northern beaches. Mm-hmm. You might remember from your old days here in Australia. Yes, and, indeed. Uh, my favourite, favourite, favourite part of Sydney or and, Australia for that matter. And this particular gentleman <laughs> had uh, had uh, four daughters. His loan application, uh, you have some free-form text you can enter and explain your loan application purpose. And uh, his loan application purpose said, I have uh, four daughters. I funded the first three weddings myself. I need a little help on this last one. <laughs> and this was, a, this was a gentleman who owned his own house. He'd been employed uh, for... For a long time in a, in a very stable job, there were two incomes in the household, but they didn't want to put the, the, the final wedding on the you know, top of the mortgage. They wanted to just do it on a standalone basis and pay it off as quickly as possible. So a personal loan made sense for them. And, uh, and that's an example of a great loan use case that, that uh, was funded on the platform. Right, right. Okay. So then banks are like in the US, the banks basically exited the personal loan business for the most part yes. uh, after the, uh, the financial crisis. Are they still, I mean, people are still getting bank loans today in, in Australia. Yes. Is it all through real estate sort of back loans or how, how are the banks doing it? Well, it, it certainly was the case that what in the US you would call the community bank uh, sector, but in Australia is referred to as the mutual sector. So these are small local co-ops that right. in some cases have become uh, small banks and in other cases are still operating as a, as a society. Those those small players emerged because initially banks uh, weren't very active in things like the personal loan mm-hmm. market. What those organisations have found in the last 10 or 15 years is that the banks have become more active in the personal lending market and so they're in a sense struggling to, to because the gap that used to exist where banks weren't writing those loans doesn't really exist anymore. So it's certainly the case that banks are active in this market but what banks in Australia aren't doing at this point of time is offering people a risk-based product. Right. Okay. Right. So, in that so in that case, okay, you're the guy who's defunding the fourth wedding. He could have got a bank loan. He could have got a bank loan, but it would have been a higher rate. It would have been in a higher rate. Okay. Okay. So, why is that? Because it's just because they can. Is that? Uh... Well, I think you have that classic Clayton Christensen innovators dilemma problem. Your back book is so enormously profitable, and marketplace or P2P lending is so early and unproven that you would sacrifice an awful lot of profitability in the back book to meet a market threat that hasn't yet proven it's going to get to scale and be, right. you know, uh, significant. And so, you know, you sort of want to fight today's problem, I guess, if you're a, a line manager. It's a very rational decision in a large organization to say, that's really a tomorrow problem, it's not a today right. problem, therefore I don't need to react. So can you give us an example of the sort of rates that, uh, that you charge versus what the, the banks charge? So an average personal loan over the last uh, four years in Australia uh, has been at a rate of about 14.5%. And you know borrowers on the Society One platform can get funded from as low as uh, 10%. 
So that's a pretty significant saving. In fact, Peter, we calculate that since we got started, we've managed to save um, almost $700 per loan that we've written for people over the life of their three-year loan uh, in terms of uh, having taken a loan with us as opposed to going and paying the standard rack rate from a bank. Uh, and that's across all the credit grades that we write. So we're very confident that there are real savings for people. And, and as I said earlier, it's really a case of having them furnish us with the information that confirms they're in the, uh, they're in the low default risk category. Right. And so one thing I know in this country that's a little bit different to the US is that a lot of people do these, you have these comparison sites where you can yes. go on and yes. say, right, you want to, you want to loan for, you know, for $20,000 and you want to pay over three years, give me all the different prices. And, and so you compete in that, in that kind of, uh, in that space, I guess. I mean, is that, is that a primary channel for you, these, compa- these interest rate comparison sites? It's one of the important channels. And if you, Look on one of the larger comparison sites, for example, Rate City. You'll see that Society One is one of, if not the cheapest, unsecured personal loans in the market. So it, it is an important channel. I think uh, what you'll see emerge over the next couple of years is an expansion in the level of awareness that people have about this category and the opportunity to to get a loan with someone other than a bank, which is not something many Australians are aware of at this point in time. Mm-hmm. I think you'll see other let's call them more traditional channels, become very important as they have in other markets around the world right. and, and not just the sort of uh, comparison sites which tend to be a good early hunting ground for, for players like Society One. So is it, are you offering just primarily a three-year loan? Do you have a multiple different uh, products or is it...? Yeah, I mean, part of our business model that's a bit different is we believe that um, to really build an interesting scale P2P lender and also to diversify the investor's risk, we need to be in more than just one asset class. So we have two asset classes today. One is an unsecured consumer personal loan, and the other is a secured livestock uh, loan, which is an SME loan to rural Australians. All right. Okay. So for people who live on a farm and they it's uh, secured by by the property, is it? Well, not the property, because no. uh, that would be uh, that would be the sort of collateral that banks would typically want to take. Right. We're very interested in the trading stock. We think that our macro thesis is that rural Australia is a is a very attractive uh, investment candidate over the long term, uh, given the opportunity for Australia to be the food bowl of, of the region in part. And so we're very interested in helping Australian stock agents and farmers grow their business. And we've built a product that's quite innovative. It, Peter, it basically allows a stock agent to go to a live auction yard and make a purchase of a set of cattle once they've been pre-approved for a, a small business loan facility in the ordinary course. Uh, that loan, though, is secured against the stock themselves. Now, all the stock in Australia have to have an RFID tag in their ear. It looks a little bit like a, a car ID number or right. a unique serial number, and you can register that on what's called the PPSR, the Personal Asset Register. So you can effectively take a primary secured interest over the stock, uh, which is the first time really that uh, stock agents and farmers have had the ability to fund the working capital other than by regard to the collateral they own in the farm itself. Interesting, right? And secondly, it's the first time that investors in uh, the city have had a chance to invest directly in a portfolio of um, secured livestock. And, uh, you know, everyone, of course, needs to form their own view about the merits of these asset classes, but uh, it's an asset class we find intriguing, first of all, because uh, livestock prices in Australia haven't historically been correlated with unemployment rates. Mm -hmm. So you're offering your investor base some non-correlated diversification. The second thing is you actually uh, can get a portfolio of secured loans where the underlying security actually gains uh, in weight, and weight is historically correlated with value, Right. and therefore, uh, unlike, <laughs> well, a, yes. unlike a dentist chair or a car, where as soon as it leaves the showroom, it, it decays in value very rapidly, Right. You, your, your wonderful thing about livestock is uh, they, they gain in weight. So, look, it's, it's just an interesting example, I think, of how P2P lenders who have a technology platform that's quite extensible, it's not sticky tape fit for purpose for only one asset class have the potential to build these quite niche tailored products mm-hmm. and then go to market with channel partners uh, in this case we partner with uh, Ray White Rural who are one of the last independent stock agent networks in the country and uh, you know that provides us with a lot of extra credit and, and, and verification data and it also gives us a fantastic channel to roll the product out so I sort of think that the future is going to be more about those sort of partnerships uh, where you can get additional data to discriminate the credit underwrite decision and we have a channel partner who's motivated to offer their end customers an option other than just throw everything in terms of your working capital against the farm 
uh, because strategically what, what you want is to preserve that collateral to buy the farm next door when you know the right. opportunity presents yes. itself and have the better quality Australian farmers scale up and uh, and service the customers. Oh, it's fascinating. That makes, that makes perfect sense to me to have the, the actual asset itself, the what you're buying, what you're using the money for, have that as the collateral. In fact, it's not like a car right. that de- depreciates every year. So, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Okay, so then let's switch to the investor side. Who Who is investing today? Obviously, it's, it's what we would call in America accredited investors. You call them here sophisticated investors. But yes. What like do you do you have institutionals coming on on board? I mean, are these high net worth individuals who who are the investors? It's a real spectrum. It's it's people who work in the finance industry who are familiar with the asset class. It's a set of sort of uh, retirees. We have uh, some small family offices. Um, we have uh, some institutions who are investors as well. So we have a whole spectrum. I think what's important about our platform is that uh, we're very careful to make sure it's a fair fight in terms of the way the allocation of loan interests works on our platform. There's no first-class citizens. Everyone has the opportunity to come and uh, participate on an equal footing. And so the specific mechanics around how we do that allocation are architected to preserve the principle that no matter who the investor is, whether they're over time a retail investor or they're a large institution, it's a fair fight in terms of access to the same information and the same time window in which to respond and, and express view. So do you have an API for automated investing or is, this, is, is it still done on a manual basis? Uh, we do have an API, but we don't. Uh, we haven't yet released that natively, so we use that with a set of limited beta partners. Um, right. right now we actually have uh, a surplus of investor demand in our marketplace, and so you know, we'll, we'll be working on increasing our borrower origination volume and then right. exposing that publicly. That'll, that'll be the plan in the next uh, little while. Uh, there's lots of other platforms who have that same uh, that yes. same surplus. Yes, there is. <laughs> yes, there is. So it's, it's a wonderful problem to have. But right. uh, yeah, yeah. So are you are you open to new investors right now? Are you're are you like do you have any international investors coming on board? Or right now we have uh, we have only domestic investors, right. um, but we're in discussion with a number of international players, and we've had over a period of time a number of discussions, and I think. We have a view about how we'll open that marketplace up and make that possible. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. So then, what? It, what, what? You've obviously you've been operating now for a couple of years, and you've got some track record. But so, I guess, what returns are you delivering, and uh, what are the expectations that you're telling investors now that they, as far as returns are? Well, we've been delivering uh, high single-digit, low double-digit returns, net of uh, fees and defaults. Uh, for investors who were exposed across both of our asset classes since we launched. And so we're very happy that given the constraints of the credit environment I described earlier and the fact that we're starting with a cold start, you know, we've we've achieved our target for investors that had exposure to both those asset classes since day one, which was to get people a sort of double-digit return. And so I think we've proven that even in a, a ZERP, uh, <laughs> low low-yield environment, you can uncover attractive asset classes, you can you can attract quality borrowers and you can successfully discriminate, you know, uh, low-risk uh, borrowers and price them correctly. So I think having done those things, Peter, we feel like now we're in a position to really start to, to ramp up the growth of the book. But that's been the track record so far. And I think one of the problems in terms of having a backed-up book of investors is the existing investors want more right. as well as the net new. And that, that always tells you, I guess, you, you're doing something right. Um, well, you can talk to Lending Club or Prosper about that. That's, they're very much in the same boat there. Yep. So so let's talk about the loan book. Can you share like what is your current volume? What's your what's your expected volume for the rest of this year? What Where are you at? Well, we can't, uh, we can't disclose that uh, just yet. We'll be making a series of announcements in that direction very shortly and, and as a result, opening up some other data. But uh, what we can say, Peter, is we're seeing continued uh, solid growth. And part of what we did towards the end of last year was complete a round of funding with a group of quite prominent Australian investors. And the plan uh, that we're now rolling out is to really start to uh, raise awareness about the category. And right. I, think, I think the big thing at the moment, to be completely candid, is still far too few people right. bother to research online and therefore find us in the places we talked about earlier because the you know, historically, Australians haven't had many choices other than the usual suspects. Mm-hmm. And so we really have a, a lot of education and, and, and awareness raising to do in the market generally. Right. So I want to talk about that funding round real quick because I don't think, you know, it was like, well, I couldn't believe it when I actually read the article that you were able to pull this off. And it's, it's probably the equivalent, just so that to benefit the US listeners, 
it's almost like the equivalent of like if Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, and Larry Ellison got together and put an investment in. I mean, these are these literally are the most prominent family names in Australia when it comes to you know these are people who are in the top five wealthiest families. How and and you know you've got like you know Rupert Murdoch, who US listeners would know, you know is uh, who what is an Australian that many people don't know that. But anyway, his his company. You've got the Packers, who are actually wealthier than the Murdochs. And then you've got Kerry Stokes, um, who's also right up there. I mean, well, how did you pull that together and what's there? Why did they invest? Well, I think we were just lucky. We were in the right place at the right time. And I think that, you know, in part, we are benefiting from the success of other P2P lenders around the world and proving that, uh, you know, at scale, these can become very interesting businesses. I think what those investors have also seen in Society One is that there are some architecture and uh, and sort of business focus orientation and things about the way we operate and our technology platform particularly that lend themselves to smaller geographic markets where you can do multiple asset classes sort of almost from day one and you can synthesize those into a single aggregated view for the investor. And I think that's quite important because I'm not sure you can come to these, you know, by the US and UK standards, quite small regional geographies and and build interesting scale businesses just just within one asset class. Mm-hmm. So I think the thing they liked is that this is an opportunity to to operate across a range of asset classes, uh, which has all of the attractions we talked about. And right, you know, I think right. So and I want to get back to the other point that you said that you know you you talking about ramping up and you obviously raise this round of money. You you obviously have you have cash on your balance sheet. And you know, I talked to other you know I've been talking to other people in this industry in, in Australia and. They've been a little bit surprised, and the, the society one hasn't really ramped up their marketing yet. What, what, so you obviously you've had this money in your balance sheet now for several months. What are you waiting for? Uh, well, watch this space. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, fair enough, fair enough. So, so what what do you think about like like? There's a lot of we had lended uh, you know just a couple of weeks ago as we record this. We had you know 32 Aussies who made the trip from about uh, I think it was like 14 different platforms. Mm. Now a lot of them, you know, this is this is not this is not a huge market. I don't know whether we can sustain all all those platforms. Maybe we can, but what do you think about like all of this? this I mean, there's so many new platforms coming on board. I mean, some of them I meet and I chat with and I've even met with today. You know, some of them are, are really I think really well run. Others looks like they're just getting going. You know, what's your attitude to this industry sort of becoming an entrepreneurial hotbed, of, so to speak. Well, my take, Peter, is I think it's I think it's a net positive. I mean, we we have a huge job to do in Australia to raise borrower and investor awareness about the category. So, with the important caveat that I hope that the people who are coming and joining us on this noble educative mission are good actors who run credible businesses and don't cause the industry to have any you know missteps. Provided that's the case, then I think we have a great opportunity to work together to to create interest in the category, and and you know with that over time, you know I query as well whether fourteen can can survive in the long term. But I do think there's room for multiple players, and I I absolutely think that uh, in the medium term the battle is not between each other; it's it's to grow the size of the pie that that is the alternate lending category of marketplace and P two P lending. So, are you, are you talking to the founders of these companies? Do you, are you when you say working together? I mean, do you have anything concrete in mind? Well, I think the only other player that's really up and underway so far is, is Daniel and yeah, Ray right, Setter, so, yeah. and uh, we have a we have a good relationship with Daniel. We do a number of things together. We recently presented a joint submission to a local after the financial services inquiry down here in Australia last year uh, or earlier this year. I beg your pardon. That talked a lot about. The need for innovation. Um, we submitted a number of uh, policy responses, and one of them was around comprehensive credit and how important that is for you know alternative lenders, uh, particularly P two P players. And mm-hmm. we did that together. So yes, as and when it makes sense, we're we're very willing to collaborate and put forward a joint bid. Right. Right. Okay. So one thing that got that grabbed my attention, you know, many years ago now, um, when we, you guys were first getting going, was when I think it was at Finnovate in. Um, you know, was it Singapore? Was that where it was? Yeah. So you demoed this mobile app, which I'd never seen anything like before. And you know, I was chatting with your partner, Greg, at Lender, and he says, yeah, you've done, you're doing a lot more work in mobile now. I get, like, can you explain 
how, how mobile fits in with your with your strategy from the borrower's side, especially and like a borrower's coming through there, are they applying for loans on their phones today? Yes. So how? Well, what's what's your strategy there? So how does well, it work? Well, one of the things that uh, was obvious to us some time ago is that you can't just adopt a, a Me Too strategy. You've really got to try and build on the success of some of the early pioneers in the P2P market and then try and say, well, what else can we do in addition to that? And one of the areas we've focused on, as you know from the very early days, is uh, architecting for a mobile-first experience. One of the constraints, though, in this particular geography is that there's a set of policy and process steps you have to put in place that are around disclosure and the form of those disclosures, which don't lend themselves easily to sort of responsive design or mobile apps or other mm-hmm. things. And so there are a set of constraints that don't exist when you show like the working version of the product of Finnovate, but do when you then go to roll it out in the real world. And so there have been some, uh, you know, sort of, let's say, say compliance and regulatory factors that we've had to consider in terms of just how clean and simple we can make that as opposed to, you know, trading off, um, making sure we're doing everything we need to do from a disclosure and compliance point of view. But having said that, you can come to Society One and get an online experience or a, particularly a, a mobile experience that we think is uh, right up there in terms of what you can get anywhere else in the industry. So what, can you give us a rough ballpark? Like what percentage of your borrowers are applying on the phone? Well, on the- more than 60-something percent of borrowers last week coming to the top of our borrower process is coming on a mobile device. Wow, more so- than 60 that's that's really impressive. Um, yeah. that, that's way above what the US platforms would be. So, in, in, that, that, that is in. so what? So then, what about investor side? Are the investors is it is it is it far higher on the borrower side than the investor side? Yep. That's yeah. the investor is plus fifty percent of people are trying to access on a tablet or a mobile device. Okay, which is pretty extraordinary. But then again. Australia has this history, as you know, of being yeah. a little slow to get started, and then all of a sudden. Well, I think when it comes to mobile phone technology, Australia is way ahead of the US. Has that's been right. for fifteen plus years. Well, that's, yeah. that's right. In yeah. mobile, so you know, we. I mean, I think the vast majority of our investors are uh, regularly using tablets to like, review their accounts and engage with them. Right. Their right. experience. Right. Okay. So then, I mean, we, we talked a little bit about. We touched on this a bit. Just, um, I wanted. Like you, you talked about multiple asset classes, so you're in you're in two asset classes, and I love the fact that they're not really correlated. And mm-hmm. are you planning on more asset classes, you know, real estate or any kind of? Uh, are you talking about different verticals? Where are you where are you focusing on further growth? Well, for us, uh, I mean, I think that uh, there's. There's certainly no limit to what we ultimately want to get to, but for the next little while, Peter, we're very focused on what are adjacent product categories to our current consumer unsecured loan and what are adjacent categories to our current uh, SME loan. And our interest is not to try to build a open to all comers in any vertical kind of generic SME product or generic consumer product per se. We want to build some quite tailored and niche products that solve a particular point in time credit needs of, of particular borrowers. And so we imagine that we will have, every year, we'll be adding asset classes to our platform and they'll either be adjacent products that an existing Society One borrower could move into at the next life stage, or they'll be products that are, you know, obvious and, and other candidates either for existing or net new customers to adopt. Okay, so before I let you go to score, I want to talk about, like, the, the long-term play here. I mean, are you, are you really focused on... Becoming, you know, like you talk about Lending Club, and they're they're really they talk about their being. You know, this, is, this is really the banking system of tomorrow. Bank, you know, people will take out loans through marketplaces. Is this? Are you planning on you know becoming sort of a viable alternative for the long term for someone going to apply for a bank? Are you planning on growing to become? You know, two point five percent of the GDP of this country has been profits, or like, or and my other, I'm, I'm I'm saying that jokingly, but obviously, are you planning on staying here, or are you planning on uh, you know buying Lending Club one day? I mean, what's your, <laughs> or are you going or going international? What's the? Yeah, what's no, the, I mean, I think we would we would see ourselves as being certainly primarily based in Australia, and our goal, Pete, isn't so much measured in. What do we want the loan book to be or what percentage of the P2P market that we want to be? Our goal is, in fact, to empower Australian borrowers and investors in ways they haven't been 
in power before. And I mean, if you say, what are we really passionate about? What we're really passionate about at the moment is that in Australia, historically, all of the power has sat with the institution issuing the credit and not with the credit worthy borrower. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we are passionate about empowering borrowers by giving them back control of their own credit data. We're the first people ever in Australia to give away free credit scores. So right, people so for the first yeah. time can get access to a credit score. That means in two minutes without uh, creating a, an adverse record on your file that's permanent and enduring, you can find out A, how much you're going to be able to borrow and B, uh, at what rate. And you know that, that sort of price discovery capability has never existed in this market. You, know, you have to actually go and apply for the loan before anyone would tell you are you worthy and right. at what rate you're going to get it. And then once you've done that, you've created an enduring ding on your credit record right. and you've filled in 67 fields and waited two days. Like, who wants to do that again? <laughs> yes. So we're really trying to upend the apple cart here and put the borrowers back in control. And we see this whole sort of sharing economy, collaborative consumption movement is, is really about a power shift away from institutional trust towards in individual trust. And we're in a sense creating a platform where your name and address will always be protected and not revealed. But the other information about your lifestyle and your behavior that's germane to a credit assessment can be posted in the marketplace and people come and bid to underwrite you alone. And I feel that that, that power shift becomes very visceral when people then see on our platform who are approved for a loan, you know, investors coming in and bidding to underwrite their loan. And as that process occurs in real time, the borrower has this moment where they say, well, hang on a minute, this is, this is amazing. I'm in control. These people are validating my life purpose and my credit need. And I think it becomes becomes much more then than just how big your loan book and, and what share of GDP are you. That's a very <laughs> that's a very noble mission, the one that we actually care about very right. deeply. So Okay. Well, that's what we're trying to do. Great. Well I will end on that note. Thanks very much, Matt. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Peter. Okay. You know, I have to say that I've been very impressed with Society One pretty much from the, the first time I found out about them. And, you know, the Australian connection aside, I think they're, they're, they're a company that are, that are doing interesting things. They're innovative. They've, they've sort of had a, a very much a, a technology bent from day one. And they're, I think they're pushing the envelope in that area. And they're just, I think they're doing things that, uh, that, that few other companies are, are thinking about. It'll be interesting to see. I mean, they've certainly got everything going for them. They, they've got a, a real A-list investor, investor base when it comes to the back, their, their backers. And they are, they're certainly very well positioned to be the lending club of Australia. I think, you know, they certainly have an opportunity, you know, to ramp up their business and, and their loan volume and, you know, really become a major player, you know, globally, whether or not, you know, they really become to the scale of, of, of lending club, you know, is probably not really all that likely in a, in a country the size of Australia, but they can certainly, you know, be at the equivalent size and I think enjoy equivalent success. Be very interesting to watch. I can't wait to hear the announcements that they've they've got up their sleeve. We'll certainly be be covering that on Lend Academy. Anyway, on that note, thank you very much for listening, and uh, we will catch you next time. Bye.